Hello and welcome to the Buy, Sell, Hold Spotlight presented by Sports Car Market Magazine. I'm Darren Roberge. Before we begin, please take a moment to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Also be sure to join in the conversation and share your thoughts by leaving us a comment below. Our guest today is podcaster, author, and subject of my favorite TV show of all time, Chasing Classic Cars. Welcome, Wayne Carini. Hey, Darren. How are you today? For those who may not be familiar with you, why don't you introduce yourself and give us a little bit of background? Well, um, I started uh, Chasing Classic Cars 18 seasons ago, and uh, before that, uh, and part of what I'm doing still today is restoring cars at F40 Motorsports, uh, F40 Restoration. So I started with my dad in uh, 1951. Um, and he was the founder of the Model A Restorers Club back in 51. And I was sort of weaned into the uh, family of restoration and car collecting. Um, as soon as I could hold a piece of sandpaper in my hand at about eight years old, I was hired. Through high school, I decided that uh, I didn't want to do the same thing he did because he was working seven days a week and I really didn't like that too much. So I decided I was going to be an architect. I'd won uh, a, a a prize at the uh, Hartford Home Builders Association, um, Builders of the Year, and I was chosen for my my uh, drawings and my sculpture. So anyways, I went to Pratt Institute of Technology down in New York for a semester. I hated it and uh, went back to school in Connecticut and uh, then went back to work for my father, not seeing the job I really wanted. So uh, went back to work for dad and here we are, uh, you know, many, many years later. Um, I'm, very proud owner of uh, F40 Restoration, F40 uh, Motorsports. And then I was given the opportunity to do a TV show on Discovery Channel from Jim Ostrowski, the head of uh, Essex Television. And uh, it took off like a rocket. Um, and for 18 seasons, that's that's what I did. I traveled around the country, around the world, and filmed this beautiful TV show. And it's become one of the most popular automotive-related TV shows ever to be shown around the world. We're in a hundred countries now and my voice is dubbed in 36 languages that's got to be a trip pretty amazing stuff for sure well one of the things that you were really known for on your show was was uncovering and restoring some of the most expensive cars in the world which 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 makes your current project uh kind of interesting and kind of different uh, why don't you describe the book that you have recently written and and what inspired it so the book's Affordable Classics, and, and we just wanted to point out to people that there's every type of car for every type of collector and every type of price point. And so for people that wanted to get into the collecting world, they always came up to me and said, what's the first car I should buy? What's the car? How can I jump into this great hobby that you're part of? And I always said, well, buy something unusual, affordable, and buy what you like. And that's the key to the whole thing. You know, don't take your Uncle Charlie's advice or or your cousin Jimmy's advice, just buy what you like. And, yeah. and uh, we think that works the best for people. And, and uh, buy something that, that's affordable, that you can have some fun with, that you're not breaking the bank and making payments every month and, and then not, not being able to enjoy the car. So we, in Affordable Classics, we, we guide people on that journey, what to buy for the first time and, uh, and, and what car to buy maybe for the 50th time too, because we want people to really understand Oh, how great and fun cars are, you know, some, some, uh, Fox body Mustangs, maybe some, uh, early generation Camaros you know, from the early eighties. Um, these are cars that if they're well-maintained and, and, you know, we're, we're targeting a different audience. I mean, everybody doesn't want a 78 or 68 uh, Camaro. They like to have maybe an 85 or 88 Camaro because it's the, it's the car that they can think of when they were in high school or college. So we just wanted to bring the, uh, highlight some some automobiles and, and affordable classics. And there'll be another volume of that coming out uh, fairly soon too, where we bring people different styles of cars. So kind of describe the process of writing this. Um, you you kind of center in on, on several different makes and models uh, throughout the book. Um, what, what Where was the ground zero on this? And kind of where did you decide to go? And, and what was the process of, of choosing the cars that you, uh, that you profile in the book? Well, just like I tell people, uh, buy the cars you like, it's cars that I like. And so therefore... I think that that's really something or sort of, you know, so, something I really can uh, stand behind. And we, we just wanted to do the pros and cons too. We're not here to sell cars. We're here to sell fun and to give you an idea of what you can buy for a certain uh, dollar amount. And it, you'll see a dashboard on, on each each car. And we tell you the, the pros and cons, you know, things that can go wrong. So I, I think that that was ground zero was just um, thinking of the cars that I truly like myself and can recommend to people. 
Did you have like price parameters or anything sort of set in place when you were kind of making these decisions about what cars to pick and, and what is kind of the general range throughout the book? Well, we want people to find cars that they can afford. So let's say from $100,000 on down, we're not going to recommend a three hundred dollars or $400,000 car. It says affordable classics on the title. So we want to make sure that they are affordable. Um, Porsche 944 is a good example. Were there any notable cars that you sort of deliberately left out for one reason or another? Um, yeah, stuff that uh, that's always on the end of a tow hook. Um, so again, you know, we wanted to make sure that you would enjoy it. So uh, maybe don't buy, um, a, you know, a Jaguar XJ6 sedan. Uh, it might be in the shop a lot, you know, or, or, or a car that really tends to rust out a lot. You know, we just won't, don't want you to buy a car that's fluffed up and it looks great. And next thing you know, it's totally falling apart. So there's, there's a lot of cars in that type of category. So uh, on that kind of same token a little bit, uh, in hindsight, uh, looking back, is there any cars that you sort of wish you maybe did include that you didn't include? Well, there's a lot of that stuff coming out in the, in the second book. So volume two is going to come out with, with different cars, different themes. Myself, I, I never knew that uh, Mazda Miata was so much fun to drive. Now, all these years, I just sort of poo-pooed the idea. And then I got one in trade on another car and I drove it. I said, oh my God, what I've been missing for many years. I mean, this car is fantastic. You could buy that car for five or $6,000 and have a ball with it. And it's, it's indestructible. I mean, this is a kind of car that you get, it's got 80, 90,000 miles on it. And in a normal car, you'd go, oh my God, the car's worn out. It's, it's just broken in. It's about to have fun. Whereas if you bought a Lotus Elan, which that car was basically designed after, and you wanted it, you bought something with eighty or ninety thousand dollars, you better figure in the cost of totally re rebuilding the car, uh, you know, in order to have some fun. So we just wanted to bring cars that made financial sense to people. Yeah, and I'll tell you, I mean, it really is an exciting time to sort of be entering into this marketplace. I mean, there's more points of entry than there's ever been before, and and you're right, you're talking eighties, you're talking sixties, seventies. And again, things like Mazda Miatas and the aftermarket is there. There's a racing series for those things. I mean, it's so easy to get passionate about cars now and, and more easier probably than it's ever been before. So, I mean, I think the timing of this, of this book is, is really, uh, really appropriate. So uh, what is your overall favorite car that you profiled in the book? I think probably a 944 Turbo Porsche. Um, I think that that's a really great car. Uh, bang for the buck. You can't really beat it. It's so well balanced. You can take it on the track. You can, and, and it doesn't really need a lot of maintenance. You know, the timing belt's easy to change. Um, and, and these are the things that we look for. It's just making sure. And of course, it's got box electrics um, and fuel injection. So uh, again, we love the Mazda Miata. We don't want to say too much great things about that because there's so many other great cars to talk about. So uh, I think I think the 944 is really a great car for the money. Yeah, great car, iconic. It's been in media. It's been in movies. You have this wonderful support system. You have a great lifestyle laid out. The PCA is a wonderful organization. I mean, if you're trying to enter into this marketplace, I mean, it's pretty hard to, to, to do, uh, do better than a 944. So uh, where can people get this book? So WayneCarini.tv, um, and you can go to our website. You can find find it in our store. Um, you can get it uh, through um, uh, F40 Motorsports, our, our website too. So uh, there's a couple different ways of getting it. Um, and if you want, I sign it too. So it's available for uh, to be signed by me. And uh, hopefully a lot of people will buy it and enjoy it. Uh, we've been selling them like hotcakes. So I, I think it's taken off really well. And uh, we can't wait for the second version. Good stuff. And we'll certainly leave a link to it uh, in the video description down below. So that's just one yeah. of your many current projects. Another recent project that you have uh, have begun is Talking Classic Cars podcast with Jay Ward. Um, we know Jay Ward as, as the uh, the guy, the car guy behind the Disney Pixar movie uh, series Cars. Um, so yeah. how did you get connected with him? Did you know of him through that? Like what other stuff has Jay done? How did that whole thing materialize? I was out at a, a pig roast out at Eric Zausner's out, out in California, in Emeryville, California. And uh, he had a little hot rod, a little Model A hot rod that was uh, that was just sort of thrown together. And, and uh, really, uh, actually a blank out uh, over the seat. You know, the interior wasn't really completed. And then I really took a liking to the car. We started talking about it. We became instant friends. And we've been great friends since. So that was probably about 15, 16 years ago. Um, and, and we had very similar tastes in cars. We love hot rods. We love everything to do with 
with unusual cars too. Um, and, and I enjoyed his work and what he's done with the, with the cars movies. Um, fortunately for knowing Jay, I've got to, to tour Pixar studios a couple of times and it's a, it's a blast to go there and see that. And, uh, and then Jay and I hang out with wherever we are, um, and, and do a podcast now together. And, and it's easy to do something like a podcast uh, with a good buddy that, you know, you, you know, you should sort of bounce ideas off of each other. And, uh, so we got some great interviews and of course that's on the, the new network that I'm involved with which is speed vision. So speed vision's back and now we've got some new shows coming out and we're going to be broadcasting them on speed vision. Uh, Bob Scanlon, who was the president of velocity channel started speed vision with Roger Warner, uh, many, many years ago it was bought by Fox and turned uh, into speed. And then it went to, to Fox sports and finally Fox sports one. And, uh, uh, Bob Scanlon left, uh, Fox and went over to discovery and created the uh, velocity channel. And that's the first, I was the first TV show on HD theater, a uh, car related television show on HD theater, which was a high definition ne network, some discovery channel. And then it turned into the velocity channel. And we had such great TV shows on there. Um, and then a motor trend bought it and took it in maybe a little bit different direction. And, and so, uh, that's fine, but we, Bob left and, and, uh, uh in a retirement, I said, I know you're not retiring. So when you figure out what you want to do, I want to be part of it. About two years ago, he called me and said, how would you like, like to be one of my partners in Speed Vision? So we got a good group together, got uh, streaming services on Roku, Fubu, Amazon TV, and many more to come. So uh, this is an exciting time for, for uh, automotive television because uh, we want to bring automotive television back to what it was several years ago and now some of the stuff that, that you're seeing today. Yeah, I agree. I think it's an enor enormously exciting thing that you're doing here with this. It, it does to me seem like there has been a bit of a hole that's been sort of drilled in the middle of, of automotive television programming where you've kind of got a lot of shows that are exactly the same, that are kind of gearing towards the same type of audience. But that audience isn't sort of that traditional old school speed vision slash velocity kind of thing where we're talking about a broader scope of cars rather than just resto mods sure. and and rat rods so uh, what what other kind of programming can we expect from speed vision moving forward are we going to be talking about racing stuff uh is it going to be more shows like chasing classic cars is it going to be kind of a more of a primary podcast platform like where do you kind of so, see yourselves taking uh, the new speed vision well you're going to see uh, many different types of shows but we as, as we say we're going to try to get the band back together um, and, and have basically the same type of lineup that we used to have on Velocity, where you can see um, custom cars being built. You can see me out uh, chasing for classic cars. You can see restorations. You can see uh, classic car shows, you know, going to concours and things like that. Um, but, but maybe uh, twist it to, to a little um, younger audience uh, than it was before, but still taking care of the older audience. And also, uh, we, we're putting a deal together with the um, Island Man TT to be able to show a, a broadcast of that. And then some racing programming we're working on right now to, to show uh, many different styles of racing. Um, so, you know, it's going to be a little bit of everything. Uh, automotive television as, as well as we're, we're looking at uh, maybe airplane races, uh, motorcycle races, car races, that type of stuff. Just bringing things together where people enjoy it. So people love that style of programming where it's not so much the nuts and bolts of the, the engine going in the car, what's the horsepower, what's the cubic inch. They want to know the story behind each car. The, the, the heart and soul of, of chasing classic cars is why it was special. Uh, it was the way that you guys approached it. And I think, I think that's kind of been leached out of automotive TV a little bit. The educational purposes, I think, are there to a certain degree. Yeah. But it's not a lot of sort of the behind the scenes nuts and bolts of the industry that people may not understand. So I think combining those elements is, is going to create for a, uh, a, a successful uh, 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 endeavor for sure. Bringing speed vision back is so important to, to our world. You know, we, we sort of lost traction as to where we were going. Uh, that, you know, when, it, uh, you know, Velocity first started out, it was so such a great time. It, it was great getting to know all the people that were in the different shows. You know, we'd travel around, we went to SEMA and we'd all be together. We want to do that again is, and just bring our fans the, the best experience possible. 
in addition to uh, television, streaming, internet, uh, podcasts, you name it, you also have a magazine. Um, why don't you give us a little bit of rundown on that? Tell us what it's called and tell us what you're doing with it. So, yeah, that's a really great part. Um, we're doing a new magazine. It's called Wayne Carini's The Chase. And it used to be Mesh Magazine, uh, Russ Rocknack, uh, he owned the magazine. And then we sort of uh, uh, blended together and we came out with this new great magazine. We got great writers, uh, Ed Welburn, uh, Bill Warner, Judy Stropas, so many great uh, authors and, and uh, writers. And it's sort of a lifestyle magazine. You know, we're talking about car shows, upcoming auctions and things like that. But I got to tell you, my magazine is fantastic. But Sports Car Market is the magazine that is always in my briefcase, no matter where I travel. I read it from cover to cover many, many times. It's always something very informative in the magazine. It is by far my favorite magazine in the world. So a uh, really great magazine. And please, everyone, uh, uh, subscribe to Wayne Carini's The Chase. You'll find that on our website also. Well, you've also got a day job, um, F40 Motorsports, uh, certainly one of the uh, predominant dealerships on the East Coast and across the globe. Um, talk about interesting inventory. What do you guys have in stock right now? Oh, we've got a really great inventory. Uh, you know, uh, we always do well with Dinos. Um, so we've got uh, three Dinos in stock right now. Um, and then unusual cars. You know, we've, we've got stuff. We've got a 560 SL Mercedes in 87 with 2,700 miles. Low mileage stuff is what I really love in my personal collection. And, and I don't know why, because that just tells me that I can't drive it. Unfortunately, I don't want to put any more miles on it. I have a Cadillac CTS V wagon, a, a 2014, a, a six speed car. It's got 9,800 miles. I'm just afraid to drive it. That was extra 200 miles and, and have it say 10,000 miles. So it sits. Um, you know, so. We've, we've, we've all always got great inventory. Um, it comes and goes rather quickly too, which is a good sign. Um, during COVID, it was the best times that we've ever had in sales. You know, first three months were very scary because the phone didn't ring and, and nobody stopped in. Um, and suddenly the phone started ringing and we were doing a lot of Facebook live, um, you know, and, and bringing the, the cards live to the people that were looking to buy it. And sales were just skyrocketing. We couldn't find cars enough to sell. And so, but the, the automobile became a, a, a safe haven, someplace where they could go and be safe. They could go for a drive. They could get out um, and, uh, and and just enjoy the countryside. I know myself, I just took delivery of a, a new C8, one of the early C8s. And my autistic daughter, Kimberly, and I would get in every Saturday afternoon at one o'clock. We go for a four hour ride to nowhere, just driving around. But, and that's changed, you know, our lives all changed because we, everything is done in high gear, you know, foot to the floor. Now, how do I get the quickest way from point A to point B? And, and no matter where you're going, the grocery store or just out for a Sunday ride, the destination is the focus instead of the ride being the focus. So I think that a lot of that happened. And that's why we were so busy selling cars and still are today. I mean, it's the markets dropped off a little bit. It's, it's, it's softening up a bit, but yet, um, you know, we've got Daytona of, of growing stock, uh, we've got, uh, of Lincoln, we've got, uh, LBJ's, uh, limousine, uh, just came in to sell. Um, and then everything in my personal collection, which is not for sale, but it, it's still kind of fun. And then the restoration shop is super busy. We're, we're doing a Griffith, uh, uh, that I found in chasing classic cars and restoring that car was for myself. And then, uh, one of my clients came in and had to have it. So we're doing that for him. We're doing it Edwards America, uh, for pedal this year, um, for one of our clients with the same last name as the car. So, uh, we're, we're in crunch time, you know, it always happens to us. We work best under pressure. So, uh, their car is painted and the engine's going in, uh, tomorrow. And, uh, you know, we're only a, a few handful of weeks away from having to go to Pebble, but, uh, the interior is not done or anything, but, you know, we'll get there. We'll do it. Um, and then we've got a car that's going to Villa Dents next year, uh, kind of like Valkyrie, um, Br Brooke Stevens design car. And it was actually Brooke Stevens wife's car. So, um, we're doing that. We've got, uh, a DB6, a DB4, um, uh, two 330 Ferraris. We got a GTC and a GTS we're doing, uh, uh, the 29 uh, Rolls Royce Playboy Roadster. So the, the gamut is full of different and, and very unusual cars, and that, but that's what we like the best.
Okay, Wayne, nobody knows this world more than you. You are everywhere all the time doing all the things with all the people. Uh, why don't you give us one car to buy, one car to sell, and one car to hold in today's marketplace? Well, I think that what I can say is, is that if somebody's looking for a car to buy and, and have a good investment and have some fun, uh, buy an unusual car. So a low mileage, unusual car, but color seems to be really the the driving force lately. You know, if you've got a, a Porsche in an unusual color, a Ferrari in green instead of red, you know, these these are contributing factors to to a good buy. And of course, the, a well-maintained car with low mileage you just can't beat it. And then buy something that somebody's really maintained very well and have spent all the money so you don't have to. Um, and, and Ferrari 328, I think it's a great car to buy right now. Uh, they're still hovering in the 175 to 100, 100 quarter for a really good one. Um, it's hard to figure that that car would be there, but look at Dino's, uh, you know, uh, super Dino's right now are selling for $900,000, a few of them on bring a trailer. Um, so it's hard to figure that a Dino is 300 grand more than a Daytona, it makes absolutely no sense. Um, but that's not why I'm saying, I'm, I'm not telling you to go out and buy a Dino right now. I, I love the cars, but I, I like them a lot, but yet, uh, I, I think it's not really a car to sell at the moment or buy it at the moment. Um, and to sell, um, I, I think that there's certain cars that have run their course. So uh, for instance, I, I bought a 2021 Mustang GT 500. Um, it's got eight miles on it. And I thought that those cars would skyrocket in value and they sort of haven't, you know, they're getting exactly about list price for the cars. What, what they've been, you know, you could buy one for, I just think they're the better looking car rather than the new models that are coming out. But, um, I may be wrong right now because that that's a great car maybe to hold on to for a long term. Um, but, uh, uh, the, the car I'm holding on to right now is not the 500, it's the GT350. I've got a GT350R, it's got six miles on it. And, and I think that that's a good hold car, um, as well as, um, a whole car, 65 Mustangs. Now, Shelby GT350, 65s and sixes are the best, uh, GT350s to buy. Of course, the, the 65 is the ultimate. I, I'm very fortunate that I own one, but the new thing I think that the market is really going to climb up on is, is, is K code cars, uh, GT fastback. So 65 and 66 Mustang. GT fastbacks and GT is, is the key to it too. Not just the regular K code car, but the GT package where you got the uh, gauge pack, you got the styled wheels, you got the rear balance with the tips that come out. I think a GT package K code car is really something to buy right now and to hold. So a little bit of both. Right? I think those cars are really going to go up in value um, and follow the GT 350s. GT350, a good one, is selling for 350 to 500,000 in that basic range. And, and who would ever think that a Mustang would sell? Of course, it's not just a Mustang. It, it sort of looks like a Mustang, but it's, it's definitely a Shelby. And it's probably one of my favorite cars in my collection to drive. Yeah, I mean, the, the GT350s from 65, in my opinion, are the greatest American road cars ever produced. So, I mean, it's, you know, if you can get in and you can hold one, I mean, what a car to enjoy the ownership experience on, what a car to, to own and to, to just look at. I mean, they're phenomenal cars all the way around the block. The uh, the paint I I issue you bring up is interesting, certainly. You know, we've seen the Porsche market really get aggressive with the paint to sample cars. But what what are some of the more extreme ranges you've seen between, you know, say comparable Ferraris or, or whatever, where, you know, a green versus a, a red? Are you seeing specific sort of lines being drawn in value between the more standard colors and the more unusual colors? Yeah, I mean, you know, Ferraris, everybody sort of wants a red Ferrari, you know, especially if you're buying your first Ferrari, it, it, it should be red. It's just that statement that you're trying to make. But if you buy a green one or you buy, you know, a, a silver one, um, it just, it's so much better. And I, all I do is look at, at, at production numbers. So if you just get, you know, when you look at production or how many green ones did they make? Well, they made eight green ones. Well, that, I'm, I own one of eight cars that was painted that color. So that is, it, you know, and you can't really dice it up too much. You know, sometimes these reports and nothing uh, to say bad about a Marty report. I think Marty report is really fantastic for Fords to know what you have, but they can dive so deep and people say, well, my car is only one of, of six main or of, for what? 
Well, the screw in the ashtray is turned to 45 degrees instead of straight up and down. You know, I mean, it gets, it, it goes way too deep in, into that kind of stuff. And it, and it sort of tells a false story about the car. Color doesn't tell a false story. But I'm a big believer too in, in, in painting a car any color you want, as long as it was an appropriate color for that era or that car or during that era, people say, oh, I, I bought a red Ferrari. Do I have to paint it back to red? I said, no. How about green? How about blue? You know, um, there's so many great colors that Ferrari offered. And people didn't really realize that till many years ago. You know, every car had to be red. They all thought every Ferrari that left the factory was red. Well, absolutely not. White Ferraris are really spectacular. It depends on where, what it is. Yellow can be a little bit too much. So a, a, a yellow two plus two car doesn't make it, but a yellow Dino or a 308 or a 328, that's really nice. So it's, it colors has to do with the size of the car, the overall structure of the car, the shape of the car. But with Porsches, I mean, these paint to sample cars are, are really fantastic. Uh, and, and it just gives you that opportunity to have something that's very unusual. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you, you got to go with the lines of the car and the style of the car, and you got to be appropriate with the paint. But from my perspective, uh, any of the Grigio iterations of Italian cars are always the way to go. Uh, any final yeah. thoughts? No, I mean, you know, the, the market is really strong right now. Um, car shows are really crazy. You know, there's I'm traveling all over the place. I'll be at the Bad the Castle show this weekend for the McGuire family doing that. Um, and then, of course... We're very proud to be part of of uh, of uh, Haggerty's new venture with uh, you know Broad Arrow and and doing that you know with the marketplace. So I'm doing some videos for the marketplace right now. So I'm very excited about doing that and being part of some really great organizations and and you know just representing the car community. And and I'm very proud of that. You know, people always tell me that you know they they enjoyed the show so much and they wouldn't be into cars. We were at well, we were at the Wilderham Hill Climb this past weekend and people came up, they said, we saw this on your show, you know, four or five years ago. And that's the reason we're here. It's so nice to hear, you know, Amelia Island, same thing. People said, I never would have come here if it wasn't for your show. So being able to represent our hobby in the car community around the world has, has been a fantastic thing in my life. Well, you certainly do a lot for sure. You got a lot going on. So, uh, you know, where can people go to learn more? Well, you can go to waynecarini.tv um, and then, of course, F40 Motorsports, F40.com. Um, those are two primary websites. So if, if you go to those uh, two places, you'll be able to find out a little bit of where I'll be. You know, we have a calendar where I'm going to be make, making appearances, what car shows I'm going to be at so I can meet and greet people um, and what rallies, so on and so forth. So uh, stay tuned to that. We have our Facebook site, um, Wayne Carini on Facebook, as well as Instagram. So uh Take a look at that. You're able to follow us uh, all across the country and hopefully around the world soon. Yeah, we'll certainly link all that stuff in the uh, video description down below. I would like to thank Wayne Carini for joining us today. To learn more about anything that we Thanks. discussed here, be sure to pick up the latest issue of Sports Car Market Magazine by visiting the link in the video description down below. As a reminder, if you enjoyed this content, please take a moment to like and share this video. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay on top of future episodes. I'm Darren Roberge, and thank you for joining us on the Buy, Sell, Hold Spotlight.